Hello. Do, do, do. Okay, let me make sure I have my lecture notes. Cool. Um, so while we wait for people to file on in, what's going on? Oh, we set this to new don't disturb. Um, as we wait for folks to file in, um, I'm going to ask if, well, first of all, a few housekeeping things. One is um, make sure you sign up for the itch jam for project two. Um, Next week uh, in the syllabus, there's not a lecture um, marked down, but I think it's a little too early to just do sort of like open time. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the lecture as normal. I'm going to do something a little out of order. Um, I just want to let you know I'm going to do, I actually have two level design textures or textures lectures that um, I give in this class. Um, so let's, because, did I lose my water bottle? Oh, crud. All right. Um, because we have, I have two available level design lectures in the, like for this course that I've given, um, let's do, like, and your project is going to involve some level design. Let's do the level uh, first of the two level design lectures next week, and then we can do the more advanced one when it's like the normal scheduled level design lecture. Um, so yeah, we can do uh, <clears throat> level design then. So I hope that is, is good. Um, last thing I wanted to cover before we get going on the lecture itself is, does anybody have any big questions or is everybody getting into the workflow and the engine okay? Because I, I saw there was like, there was some confusion in one of the groups about sizes of sprites. Somebody drew a character, but they drew kind of like un, un, uh, unfettered by, by, you know, they just like drew a sprite and somebody came back with like, oh, I think they're supposed to be maximum 16 by 16, which is true. So um, I wanted to give some tips for working with this engine. So remember part of this engine, uh, part of this project that is not just the like engine part, um, it's, or well, it is the engine part, but it's like a creative aspect of the engine part is that it's making you work within a very limited set of restrictions. <clears throat> so you cannot have a sprite bigger than 16 by 16 um, that is standalone. You can, um, through scripting trickery, make multiple sprites follow each other. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to do it because I've done it and the engine does not like it very well. Um, you know, it's possible, but it, it's kind of a pain. Uh, there is a sprite manager that you can download off of itch that does allow bigger sprites. The problem with it is that it requires you to get into the engine source code and like edit some of the C code, which, you know, like some of you might be able to handle, but, um, you know, I just, I generally am like advising. That's, it's like a bridge too far. Like I want you to stretch beyond the boundaries of some of the aspects of the project, but you know, that might, that one's a little, be careful with that one. Um, so yeah, like one of the, one of the key factors of this though, is that like the behaviors you're learning are to work within an art style that is defined by the limitations of a tool. Um, but also to work with a limited tool, you know, how are you going to make something really interesting with like a limited, um, within a, a limited piece of software that'll eventually like train you to do the same thing, but as a more purely art exercise and not necessarily as like a tech exercise. Um, but it, yeah, like other than that, so really like make sure you're looking at the documentation, reading it thoroughly. So you know which colors you need to use, 
what the sizes and limitations of things are. Um, so you don't end up having to, to redo anything. Um, there's a, a, there's a, uh, saying that I was introduced to over the weekend that is amazing. That was, uh, you know, a, a few weeks of coding will save you a few hours of planning. Um, and that is to say that like with a few hours of planning, like you end up doing things for way longer than you have to, if you don't just spend a little bit of time planning it. So don't, don't, you know, just jump into making stuff, like make sure you're making the right thing. Cause somebody who makes a big sprite is now going to have to, will have had to draw two sprites, um, instead of just drawing one according to what you're supposed to do. So be careful, uh, with that. That's a key aspect of this. Um, any, anyway, other than that kind of thing, um, how, how is it going for folks to, uh, to work within the limitations of, of this thing? doesn't seem like there's any seems like it'll be an interesting challenge yeah i like interesting challenges um one of the funny parts about this project actually is that um you've heard me say this before like when you do all the quixel mega scans in something like unreal um I, I've received projects from people that are like, here's my single level and it's like 16 gigabytes. It's because they download all of the, all of the Quixel stuff. And it's like, oh my gosh, my computer cannot handle running a level of this size. Um, so this is a good exercise in like, hopefully breaking you of that, like breaking you of that pie in the sky and getting you to think about optimization and, and things like that. Um, you know, you want to make things as small as humanly possible. Like, think of it this way. I don't know if any of you are, like, ever played a lot of games on your phone, but when your phone would start to run out of memory, like, and you'd go into the thing that would be like, all right, let me see what all the memory of my different apps are. Guess whose game gets cut first? It's the one that's a gig or... 200 megabytes or something like that. You know, you want to, how, how small can you get your build um, is a really, I mean, it's just part of optimization. Um, you know, like I've made purchasing decisions for my Nintendo Switch based on like, well, do I have to do the like 30 gigabyte download in addition to the card, right? So, you know, memory management is a thing, and, and it's something that, like, if you've taken 3D with me, I try to enforce in terms of polygon limit. Um, I am in a way, like, I encourage you when you make your games, when you build your games, and maybe just if you've got something up and running, do a build. Uh, do a ROM build from the engine. Look how much, um, look how big they are, because the default... The default build size in GB Studio is 256 kilobytes, uh, which is tiny, tiny today. Uh, it's super tiny, um, you know, and like they fit on these. And, you know, this cartridge is two megabytes. That's it. Um, but I can fit an entire game on two megabytes. Like Pokemon, uh, you know, Link to the Past or Link's Awakening, all those games that you love. Um, you know, if you've, if you've played Game Boy games, those are all like only a few megabytes. Um, so keep that in mind. Why are you not going in right? Um, so, you know, that's, um, that's something to think about as you are, uh, playing with your, your games is like how to optimize to get them to, to be a good, a good game size. Um, you know, you're, you're not, I don't think you're going to make anything that's too big. You're not going to be too big for a cartridge. Um, you know, I, I'd be surprised if any of you hit the 512 kilobyte uh, size that, like, my game is currently at. Um, but, you know, 
don't be surprised when like you know you see that your game is super small because um, it is a good exercise in learning how to make small games like learning how to get a lot out of a little so um yeah uh so today what we're going to talk about though is something kind of it's going to seem kind of artsy at first um but it's it's done in the it's done with the idea of like let's get a lot out of a little and that can be um you know there's a little bit of a, a theme this week of that sort of like tech versus design and creativity thing um you know we've been wrestling with it a little bit in capstone trying to remind people of like you know what is the thing you're really going to be evaluated on and i like to put it this way for for people coming out of school because like this is an upperclassman class um, and coming out of school, you know, now computer scientists, you're a little different because you are making software. So your problem solving is embodied within the software you produce, which is, a, you know, is the tech you produce. Um, but in terms of like us on the design end, you know, we are essentially end users. We are, we're not like, yes, we're making media things with Unity and Unreal and all this other stuff, but we are not, like, creating Unity and Unreal. We are, like, merely licensees and end users. Um, so what what that means is that, you know, the use of the tech is not that special. What we have to do is try to show that we can use the tech to make amazing things. And what gets you an edge in that is the ability to be, to show your creativity. And, you know, well, how do we do that? And and part of it with games in particular is like, how can we embody themes? How can we embody ideas and narrative um, within game systems and make these like sort of meaningful experiences? Again, that centering of, of player experience versus again, just like a technically impressive uh, game. So, you know, like we are using this complicated technology and we make cool video game things. Um, but like there is always this, this, you know, back and forth um, between like the design theory of it and the, the, you know, use of the tool. And I always liken it to, you know, if you're taking an art class and or if you're taking a, a, you know, a classic or 2D design class, and the professor starts to talk about like composition and things like that, you know, you'll occasionally hear somebody say, well, wait, isn't this just the Photoshop class? And this is something that, um, you know, I think people struggle with. Um, what is going on with my cartridge? I might need to, I might need to fix it later. Um, there it goes. Um, you know, people struggle with this in the industry. Like, if you go to the visual art track at GDC, you're going to see a lot of talks about rendering. And I counted one year, there were 77 talks one year about graphics technology in the art track and eight about fine art principles. And that was a little, um, that was a little troubling uh, because y yeah, I liken it to this. You know, when you go to a Pixar movie, you're not, and y if you watch Soul on Disney+, Plus. Um, you're not watching Soul to be like, oh man, I, I, you, you know, I want to see some cool, cool shaders. You watch Soul for the story and the music and the acting and the, the message, you know, and, and the themes and all this other amazing stuff that makes it a great film. Um, same, you know, with like any CG movie, um, you're watching it for those story and narrative elements. Um, you're not watching it because like, you know, their way of rendering hair is awesome. You know, if, if we were doing that, if we were still only, if the main draw was just this rendering technology, we'd essentially be no better than the people who, uh, after the first movie cameras came out, like one of the public first publicly released movies was just a, a short video of a guy sneezing. It was called the sneeze. We'd, we'd be no better than that because at that time, the, the technology was so novel that, you know, it, its mere existence 
was special, but now it's not special. It's just there. Um, and I told a story to my to my capstone class earlier this morning about um, a conversation I had at GDC one year with a guy I know where um, we were talking about like doing doing 3D art and they were like, oh yeah, what, what, are, what are you up to? What do you work on? And I'm like, well, I'm working on this and I'm working in Blender and I'm working on this non-photorealistic thing. And I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, and and I'm, a, I'm one of those artists that like, if I sat down and took the time, like I haven't done, let me render this as nice as possible type of 3D in years. Um, I probably could, I have the skill set to do it. Um, I just don't because that's what my projects don't end up being. Um, you know, and that's that's partially by design, but it's also just a scope matter. And you know, so I, I put that caveat on it where I'm like, well, I'm not I'm not rendering things like you are. So this is a person who like that I was talking to that was very into trying to have the best visual quality possible, trying to get the nicest render, trying to get all these bells and whistles. And uh, what it came down to is that, um, so the person said, I'm like, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm doing very different things than you are. So like, you know, don't listen to me on this. And they go, yeah, but you're the one who has a job. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, okay, that's a good point. Um, because like, you know, I know a lot of people that do chase that dragon of trying to get like the most perfect use of tech possible. Um, and then because they're only competing on that term, like there's always somebody better. And so it's like, how do you set yourself apart? And and part of how I've set myself apart um, and gotten uh, the career I've had, been able to have the career I've had, um, is that, you know, I, I personally try to figure out like, okay, how, where are the things things that make our games special where are the things that we can have some sort of like creative edge um now the creative edge that i've decided to focus on is like how art works like more classical fields of art and find intersections with games and i'm not saying you have to do that but i am saying that like you know thinking of games as these these expressive works is like a way to go and you know with that you get people who maybe their edge is making serious games or autobiographical games or empathy games or um you know uh modern art games or you know something that that has a different element to it um and that starts you know but on a more basic level you know Let's say you do get one of those AAA jobs. You know, how do you still make an experience that is rich in storytelling through game mechanics that it isn't just tacked on or it isn't just what we talked about last week where it's like cutscene game, cutscene game, cutscene game. How do you how do you merge these two in a really cool meaningful way um, if that is indeed your intention? And for that, I like to talk about systems. Um, so system is a context in which objects interact with an environment from which meaning emerges. So let's assume that our context is our game and objects are that interact are just like our game objects, right? Um, so I ask this, I like to show this scene and ask this, what do you suppose this level is? And when I ask that, I don't mean like, you know, oh, the fire and water doing something. I'm not talking about that. Don't, don't focus on the game objects. Why do you suppose this literal game space exists? What is its purpose in the development of the game? Like, am I laying this out to be a literal level that players experience? Or am I doing it for some other kind of meta developer only purpose? What do you think? What, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? What does this look like? You know, think about this. Does it look polished? Does it look like something that our players would see? I'm gonna figure out why my cartridge is being, oh, now you're acting normal. This cartridge is goofy sometimes, this, this like custom cart. My son was carrying it around, so I'm always like, oh no, what did he do? 
looks to me like a test level to test features. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's the planning. Um, it's a planning level. Um, you know, people call them different things. I sometimes call this like a toy box. Um, sorry, I'm... Ba-ding, there we go. All right. I sometimes call this like a toy box. Um, other people have other terms for it. Um, none of, I can't remember what they are at the moment. Um, but basically, yeah, the point is that you're not... Uh, some people call it like the playground. I know for Nemo, we are calling this a playground. Um, but basically, yeah, it's it's... Do we get the let's like get the system laid out? So, you know, let's go back to our definition of systems Boop. What? There we go a context So there's our game. It's our context. We're playing a game from which interact objects interact. So here um, You know we have objects so like I set up some objects I set up some switches You know the red and blue like if you can't tell you know, the switches make the, the things go invisible. Um, there's a little Mega Man version of me. Uh, this game is from 2014. It was called Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, but, you know, ice buckets dump out, like, really, really, really cold water. But And they're usually an obstacle because I'm trying to get to the mail to, like, mail a donation to the ALS Foundation. It's a serious game, but it was also a Mega Man platformer. Um, but like, you know, you can also use the things to like have the buckets of ice water put out the lava blocks so you can cross the lava blocks as a bridge. Um, but you know, I didn't just start making a level like that. I wanted to try things out and like test out the systems, um, before I, I actually like composed a scene and, and I actually built something very similar this past weekend, uh, for my, my GB studio game, Kudzu. Um, where like I create these world, I create these rooms out of just like some cave assets that I put together. Now, keep in mind, these are a little different because at 16 by 16 pixels, like, yeah, you can make test, you can make test environment art pretty easily without having to, uh, spend a lot of time. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things I like about this engine as a prototyping tool is that it is so quick because it is so easy to make some stuff. Um, at, again, four colors, 16 by 16, you know, you're not spending a lot of time on the art. Uh, it's kind of nice, but like, you know, in a game, I would never just put the thing next to the, the thing you're going to like the tool next to the thing you use to, to beat it. I would maybe have you like find it in an item room and then do a, you know, you got the thing and then you know, solve some challenges maybe to get out, but it would be more composed than this. These are kind of like blunt examples where like you got the rake. Oh, you got the rake right next to the thing that you use to use the rake on, you know, but the purpose of having them laid out like this is just like, can I pick up the rake and does getting the rake just work? And then let me just test that the rake itself, like does the sequence of getting an object work and then does the, you know, does the actual mechanism work once I have the, the item? Um, so somebody asked, is it kind of like testing out mechanics? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's not that I'm like, well, one, you should do these sorts of scenes. They're nice. But the lesson here is less about the idea of doing a playground or a toy box in general, though it's, it's a nice um, thing to do. It is about like basically, you know, here is the system unadorned. This is just the system in front of us. Like here is literal game objects interacting in an environment. Um, but here's the thing about these test levels. Like they're cool. Are they fun? Let me ask you that. Are they fun? Somebody says it is like a planning stages, testing out, test level. Is this fu like fun? We're just going to go with fun for right now <laughs> instead of meaning. Like, but for these action games, do you think this is like the best version of what this could be? Like, is this the optimal mech like way these mechanisms are laid out? What do you think? Nope. Okay, good. 
That came through. Good. Yeah, because you're just kind of like putting them next to each other and seeing if like your code functions, right? Um, and that's that's important because so um, you know, and this will get into like what we're doing next week. But in fact, ooh, yeah, that's kind of a nice flow. Maybe I'll just make level design be a permanent part of this part of the semester. That'd be great. Um, think about it this way, like. <clears throat> If we have the meaning be player experience, you know, what is our environment? Like, what when I say environment, what what is that environment? Like, yes, it's an environment. Duh. But, like, in terms of game design terms, in terms of the job of a game designer, what, what like, what the designer jobs you can get, what is our environment? Where do we have all these things interact and create meaning. Like, what is our player looking at? What's on their screen? What is the environment? It's one word. It's a type of design on a game team. Like, what is that environment? Sorry if you can hear, my son is having a meltdown. I think it's his nap time. What is the environment that we we actually make like the meaningful version of these things in? You know, so if our test level is where we're kind of like making sure these things work right, where do we actually like, where do we lay them out? Levels, yeah, exactly, levels. Level design. Um, so the environment that this takes place in, you know, our goal with level design is like we're trying to to pull out, like we're trying to arrange our stuff in a way that it is its best self, just so the player can live its be their best life in your in your game, um, and that's really important because you know level design is that sort of like all right now let's take this and turn it into this optimal, you know best experience now with these things so that's when you start to take these mechanisms and start to like put them together in interesting ways so like you know when i was tinkering around with this i pretty quickly figured out wait a minute but what if i took these button pieces and i put like you're running 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 on the red ledge for a big stretch but then what if i like plopped the red button right in the middle of the red ledge Holy cow, you could you could run over this button and then like pull the like make the floor under you disappear. And then isn't that kind of an interesting, you know, mechanism? And that just became like an interesting part of the challenge that made it feel very spooky. Like these things were helpful puzzle pieces, but then they become like potentially harmful obstacles. So, um, you know, it is it is uh it is like a big deal to to be able to um, to you know like learn to learn to juice these mechanisms, learn to use them in interesting ways, and that's why like objects interacting in your level creates like cool gameplay moments. Um, so it makes me think of this term called a game loop, which is really just your core sequence of input. It's like really it's what happens when you do stuff in the game when you are controlling the game that is your input if you think back to like you know grade school computer class um you know computers have inputs that is your keyboard uh, keyboard that is your mouse that is your controller you know whatever you're feeding instructions into a computer then the computer because of the way you've programmed the software you're using does stuff um you've 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 taught it with programming how to interpret and what to do with that input. Um, and then that usually creates some sort of output and feedback that is reflected in, you know, the graphics on the screen will change in some way. And that's really important in games to think about because that's literally what happens is like, you know, you do a thing and the graphic will update. So you move your character upward. Um, the logic says, you know, go minus X because, you know, 
x y on a computer screen is like y is actually why like increasing numbers is actually going down on the screen um but you know like you say go up and it'll make it go like up um so basically what it does is it'll re-render the scene with the character a little higher a little higher a little higher a little higher because you're pushing up um and then you get feedback, whether that just be the visual information on the screen or maybe, you know, you hit jump, Mario changes his Y location uh, in the logic and in the graphic. But then maybe like you'll get feedback of you jumped on a Goomba and you got points or you jumped accidentally into a pit and you died, you know, but games give you some sort of indication that, a behave, that the input you were doing is right or wrong. Um, this is really just kind of a blown up version of core mechanic, but it takes advantage of the fact that it's sort of like a less abstract version of the core mechanic. It is thinking of the core mechanic in terms of like, you do a thing, the computer gets to work, the computer shows you a thing, and then psychology happens, basically. So that is the core game loop, is like, what, what does the player do how does the game react how does the game show you it's reacting and then what does that make the player think about the thing they just did um so if you've not seen this before this is pico 8 this is a <sighs> game engine's the wrong term for it it's like a virtual computer that never existed it's like an emulator for a computer that never existed um, it calls itself a fantasy console, which is basically, it's like the idea of your ZX Spectrum, your BBC Micro, your Apple II, those computers from the 80s, like late 70s, early 80s that, um, or my school had like TRS 80s, that, you know, you have everything kind of like in front of you and you can make programs on it. Um, so in this, you have a programming interface, a sprite editor, a level editor, a sound editor, and a music editor all in one place. It's really neat. Um, I would, I would spend the 15 bucks to get it. Um, not only is it a cool little engine for learning coding, but it's also, um, it has lots of free games on it, including like the original, uh, the original prototype for Celeste, if you've played the indie game Celeste. Uh, they, uh, Maddie Thorson, the creator of Celeste, actually just released um, for the anniversary of Celeste One a uh, Pico Eight sequel to Celeste. Um, but I'm not here to to you know sell you a Pico Eight, you know the Pico Eight, a copy of Pico Eight. What I want you to see with it is that um, because you have to code everything in a system like this, its its core loop, its game loop, is kind of laid bare for you. When the program starts, when your game program starts, it starts with init, um, and the comment here in the code says, code here happens one time when your game starts, um, and function end. Next function is update. Now this is where you get into the input logic output thing. Um, code here happens 30 times every second, unless you do an update 60 function, which then it happens 60 times a second. Your game is super silky and smooth. Um, and then, but then there's also draw function, which code here also happens 30 times every second, but after update happens. Why is that important? Well, this is where your core game loop happens. You, you do a thing, so update would contain things like the code that runs the, the controls that like maps buttons to things. So it would say like, you know, if button is pressed, then do thing. And then, you know, it would maybe then, you know, run something within the draw function or like the draw function would, um, you know, the draw function often contains like erase the screen and then draw, you know, what is on the screen, like indicators of what's on the screen at the end of the frame. So what that ultimately means is that, you know, your computer would take input, it would do stuff in the logic, in the update function, and then it would change the graphics on the screen um, so that it represented the state of the game. So again, that's your core game loop. Um, why is that important? Again, uh, we're here not to manipulate the computer. 
we are here to manipulate and and shape the experience of a human being so this is where we get into what i um what uh i think of a lot which is situational game design um, which was created by brian upton who's one of the founders of red storm entertainment so in his book, Situational Game Design, uh, which is that one, it's really good. I like it a lot. Here's my copy. You know, and you can tell I like it a lot because look at all the flags. But this book is really cool because it, it, it's not a book about mechanics and winning games. It's a book about what happens in between mechanics and the non winning get to the end like outcome part of games it's you know it's it's about this like human part of games which i think is really incredible um so he boils down situational design to rather than focus on the actions players can take and you know we've thought a lot about that we've thought you know the first third or the first section of this semester was a lot about the actions right and you kind of need that that's like by the way we understand game design right now at the time of this recording that is the sort of basics is like there's a core mechanic and there's mechanics and verbs and you know you you do interactivity and then meaning emerges right but there's this other thing and this is like game design but focused on the person so it's like rather than focus on those actions let's take a step back so let you know yeah we're going to do actions but really what we are what our ultimate goal is again player experience it's that we want to put players in situations we want to design encounters and scenes and levels and scenarios that put players in a spot that make them have to stop and think okay what should i do next and that what i have to do next is like that's the interesting part of playing a game is you sort of like take stock of your situation. So why I bring it up in the context of a game loop is that, you know, think about the game loop in terms of like, you get feedback and then you have to think about whether or not that feedback was right. And if you understand that, really what this does is it becomes like teeing the player up for those moments of thoughtful, you know, problem solving. And those situations can can become very interesting. Um, and we do it by, again, having an engaging game loop. And that game loop allows us to create cool meaning. So here's another way to put it. In honor of uh, the uh, uh, Legend of Zelda's Japanese release's uh, 35th anniversary, um, here's a quote by Shigeru Miyamoto. And if you don't know who uh, Shigeru Miyamoto is, he designed The Legend of Zelda and Mario and a bunch of other stuff. Um, that's really great. So he says there's a place near Kobe where there's a mountain, and if you climb the mountain, there's a big lake at the top of it. We'd gone on this hiking trip and climbed up the mountain. I was so amazed. It was the first time I had experienced hiking up this mountain, seeing a big lake at the top. I drew on that inspiration when we were working on The Legend of Zelda, and when we were creating this grand outdoor adventure where you go through these narrowed, confined spaces and come upon this great lake. So it was around that time that I began to start drawing on my experiences as a child and bringing that into game development. And that is this like secret sauce of, of good game designers in a way is this idea of maybe not like every single game designer. There are some really good systems focused people that are like a little more mechanical, but you know, there is this idea of, you know, what is, what is this human experience I want to create? And then how does that get turned into systems? Because the, you know, the, the idea of like, let's, let's climb this, let's go through this obstacle, let's do this achievement of climbing a mountain or getting through narrow passages or fighting monsters. And then you have some sort of like cathartic outcome. So in the real world, it's like, let's climb a mountain and then you see a pretty lake at the top um, that is maybe like kind of amazing and breathtaking. Um, you know, in Zelda, that that kind of happens. There are a lot of, like, sometimes actual literal lakes that are sort of like, oh, that's interesting. You feel like you've discovered something. And and again, it, like I said, it's a catharsis. And But that's, that's be, 
because like he was thinking about this human experience and then you work backward from the human experience and say and now how how does that become gameplay you know it's like that becomes the design of levels that becomes the mechanics that becomes all these other things so you're trying to create a experience out of systems out of this input output system um and these like the way these mechanics work um where are we in time so i guess like are there games that you've played that that do something similar where where you can really see like the system is doing one thing but it's really like squeezing some other like where have you personally experienced this this type of thing i guess is is uh what i'm getting at here i wonder if the card is sorry i'm fiddling with this because yeah i think the card just gets tight up the screw on the back Have you ever played a game where, like, the mechanics are one way, but the they they create some other like rhetoric or or meaning or story experience, um, or like squeeze some emotion out of you, things like that. We had some good examples in the class yesterday. Keep talking until we get one. Props to the person who, who just went, hmm. I, I appreciate the flow of chat. Sorry, okay, so the question is like, you know, we talked a lot about this human experience becoming the basis of game design ideas um, and, and thinking in terms of like, put the player in interesting situations. So like, it's interesting that the situation is, let's climb a mountain and, and see a lake at the top. Um, so have you ever played a game where like, you know, where yes, there's, a bunch of mechanical things happening but it does squeeze these moments of like meaning and pausing and thinking and you know like there's a very mechanical thing but maybe it has like some sort of emotional payoff at the end so i'll, I'll give one okay so a game that I think is really remarkable in this way is, um, and one that I've I've used as sort of like a really good basis for the course, like a first encounter of a game um, that expresses ideas, is uh, Dysphoria, um, which is you know the game uh, by Anthropy about gender dysphoria. But like it has very simple game mechanics. But it's usually paired with some statement and, and contrasted in such a way that it reframes this like almost Atari simple game mechanic of a scene, but then gives you like, holy cow, wow, you know, sort of a flash of like, wow, that expresses this idea of like, maybe you've one, one of my favorites is like, I feel weird. It, it says I feel weird in my body, but you are this just kind of shape and you have to try to get through a hole in a wall and you can't do it. Um, I think that's, it's, it's very systemic, it's very mechanical, but it is this, like, it kind of gets at this, you play it, you, you go through the game's version of the gameplay loop, but then it, it kind of, like, hits you with, I feel weird in my body, and you're like, wow. Um, Journey, okay, so Journey, yeah, um, Journey's a really good example. There's, what are the mechanisms of journey? You're trying to ultimately just like reach a point on a map. But, you know, journey is interesting because 
you know, same thing, like, you, there are systems for randomly being paired with somebody online, but you can't talk. So there are, like, things you get and there are things you don't get to do. You can't, like, get into a type thing and then, like, you know, say this way. You kind of, like, you have to learn to communicate with one another non-verbally um, through motion and through, like, chirping at each other and things like that. Um, but that you get kind of attached to these people and you start to like play in non-optimal ways because you're trying to like help your friend along or be helped along or things like that. Um, would devotion count? I don't know. Devotion. Mystical Ninja on N64, same play. Zelda instills puzzles along with its level design, but sometimes offer multiple solutions. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So kind of like open-ended, you feel creative when you, when you play a game and you solve it in a way that like when there's multiple ways to solve a puzzle. Uh, Baba is you kind of allows that where like multiple game, multiple systems, like multiple puzzles let you solve things in different ways. So thank you. Um, that was great. So, you know, we can see how games do this. Like they, they make you feel creative or feel empowered or feel, um, you know, we talked about this before with like Dark Souls versus Doom. In one, the design idea is you're locked in a room with demons. Other one is you're locked in, the demons are locked in a room with you. And it does that by like messing with the balance of statistics between uh, things. So um, I do this every once in a while where I talk about projects I've worked on, not as a way to like plug my own projects, but to, um, to talk about like give you kind of the inside scoop on games I've worked on or on this experience, like on, on designing this way. Um, so the idea of like expressing things with systems is really interesting to me because I do actually work a lot in um, games as art contexts, like games in museums and, and things like that, um, both in my academic research, but also it, it's kind of like games plus the classical, you know, design uh, fields and the arts are kind of like, that's kind of my niche that I've, that I've put my flag in that to a degree. Um, so, you know, how do I, how do I do that? Like I try to express these artistic ideas with, with um, systems and I try to use systems as a way to maybe say something about a piece of art or a piece of literature um, I, I think of games as kind of like making games is kind of an essay in a way where I can do a critical essay uh, analysis paper type thing. But instead of writing it as a paper, maybe I make a game out of it. So um, so I'll talk about two games here along those lines. Uh, the first is a game called Laziski's Revenge from about six years ago, which is kind of amazing that it's already been six years. Um, so the design goal for this game was this thing that I, I was doing a game series for a while called Atelier Games, and I only ever really finished one of them. Um, but it actually kind of spun off into, I would say, a design philosophy now, uh, rather than like a explicit series of games. But the idea of Atelier Game was going to be that uh, it's a game based on a theme of an artwork using the techniques used by the artist. So. I've only literally done that once, but it has become a sort of like way I approach all design, even if I'm not doing the actual like production part of like using the same production means. Um, so the first one I wanted to do, I wanted to make something kind of simple. I wanted to make a simple arcade game that had a visual style from a famous piece of art. And I wanted to like build it in a jam kind of way less than a month. So I was teaching a graphic design course at the time, um, and there's this poster called Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge by this uh, graphic artist named El Lizitsky. Uh So this, this poster is actually like 100 years old, and uh, over 100 years old. And it's, it's a Bolshevik um, propaganda poster uh, depicting a red wedge of the Bolshevik Revolution uh, killing a white circle, which are the czars, uh, by breaking through this like barrier. At least I kind of thought of it as breaking through a barrier. And I really like Lazisky. I think his graphic art is cool. Um, you know, and I was like, well, how can I 
I got, like first I started with looking at this piece of artwork and thinking about its verbs and thinking about the action I saw. So I was like, okay, well, you've got kind of a, you know, video gamey type premise. Um, later on, I would have used like artworks that were not quite as like explicitly conflict. But here I was like, well, okay, arcade game, let's do like a conflict, right? Uh, where there's like a player and an enemy or something. And I was like, well, okay, so it looks like the Red Wedge is like bursting into like through this black shape and getting to, you know, the bad guy. And I was like, well, okay, that's kind of interesting. It's like maybe you kind of push your way through a barrier and then get like, you know, do a final attack. And I was like, wait, that starts to sound like a game I've played before. Um, and it came to me that, holy cow, um, that's just like Yar's Revenge on the Atari 2600, uh, where you are a little fly alien called a Yar, and you um, break through a force field to get to a like gun battle station, and to beat, so you have to like use your normal offensive abilities to break through the battle the the force field, uh, which is that like red mass on the right. And then you have to like go back to the other side of the screen and charge up a super attack to actually like deliver the killing blow. And um Oh You okay? Yep. Okay. Um So <clears throat> that's how the game essentially works, and there's like a safe zone in the middle, that's what all like the pixel scraggliness is, is like a place where you can't get shot. So the idea is okay. That's actually very similar, you know, with just like, maybe let's modify this and make it about the artwork. So I, um, I looked at the verbs of the game. I looked at the verbs of the art and I started comparing the places where like they kind of jived and I came up with this game, um, Lazisky's Revenge, where you are the red wedge. You have to like use a charge attack to like beat back the the black um you know barrier and it just kind of like nudges out of the way and then once the the white circle is exposed then you've got to go and kind of chill in the the neutral zone type area like these these uh gray squares that'll charge you up charge up your final attack and then you can do an attack um the the gray squares also like keep you safe so you can actually like dodge attacks by being inside of it um, so that's, that's how the game works. And, you know, what was I going for with this? Well, you know, I was thinking about the type of artwork that this is, is heavily based on understanding, like, the placement of objects and how the placement of objects creates a meaning and creates a message. Uh, it's called Russian constructivism. Um, it's also based on another art style called suprematism, but suprematism is art for art's sake. So it actually kind of rejects the idea of a message where constructivism is like full on used in propaganda. So like, you know, I was like, well, how does the meaning change if you have the placement one way or another? Um, and isn't it kind of interesting that we set up this situation where, you know, sometimes the argument against video games as a form of art is that the artist, the person with the intention hands the object of creation, the control of it to a player that might reject the message entirely and do their own thing. Um, so that's kind of interesting to me, though, is that like you could take a screenshot at any time and then it produces essentially a new piece of Russian constructivist art um, through mere gameplay. Um, so that's that's how the game works, is that it explores this idea of arrangement of forms by just letting you play with forms and shapes and, and making them move and do stuff in weird ways. You're essentially like, every time you play the game, you are editing a piece of Lazisky's art. Um, and sometimes you make the same message and sometimes you make a different message. Uh, so I implemented it in Construct 2, similar engine, quick, um, no coding involved. Uh, handmade art, uh, abstract art pieces, so they're they're like literal pieces of hand of paper that I cut out and arranged and scanned and turned into game assets. Um, they all live in an envelope in my closet now. Um, 
groups of levels. So I like turned once I kind of got the like the first poster figured out into a game level. I was like, well, what other levels can I do? That's kind of fun. So I looked at at the catalog of Lazisky and other stuff that he'd made, and I turned all of the um, I turned a bunch of his artworks into different levels. So like every world of the game is a different artwork. It's based on a different artwork, um, which then led to different mechanics and different um, different verbs. So you know, basically every level was like a different set of mechanics. You're always killing the white circle. That was always like a goal, um, simply because I got that thing to work. But uh, every level got new puzzles, including like carrying uh, other shapes around and things like that. So um, post-mortem information, was, was this good as a game design concept? And I know people always like to have a, a quantifiable outcome. So here's some quantifiable outcomes. Um, game scope in mind was nice. Being able to say like, I want to make a tiny game, made me make a tiny game. Um, but even that like... The game scope was about a one month, but, you know, double it and add a half. The The old rule of, like, you plan for this, but you're going to double it and add a half. It ended up being a three-month game. I still had to cut features. Uh, it was originally going to be a multiplayer game. I even made the multiplayer menu where it would, like, detect which controller which player was on and things like that. And then I scrapped it because I was, after three months, I'm like, that's enough. Um, I have 25 levels. That's enough. Uh, and so that took time because they were still highly customized because I was working with these like very specific pieces of art. Handmade art is super fast. I love making handmade art in games when I can. Um, so back to that novelty. Like, yeah, I'm not really pushing any, any um, you know, I'm not pushing any capabilities of any engine. All these things are very simple to make. But... The, there was novelty for gamers because they were like, I've never seen a game that looks like this before, um, that looked like this type of art. And in a way, a lot of gamers got to actually experience that type of art for the first time because they saw this game. Um, but then also, because I made a game that like took seriously this form of art and, and, and tried to make a comment on it, it got merit uh, in artistic circles. I still occasionally do a Google search for it because I will find some art professor that's found it and teaches it in a class or um, there was actually a, a it was exhibited in an art museum in Chicago uh, by Bitbash uh, at one point. Um, but I found out from the people that uh, the Bitbash folks that apparently only two weeks prior the actual original poster was also on display at that museum. So my my game and the poster missed each other by two weeks at one point. Um, so that was kind of a fun adventure, uh, a, a fun actual connection for it. Um, YouTubers have played it, and, and it actually did make some money. So, like, sometimes, yeah, make something kind of weird and, you know, novel and, and put some thought process and research and meaning behind it uh, through the systems and, you know, that's going to create a lot more creative novelty than, you know, all the times I've ever, like, you know, I see some people try to, sometimes they'll, they'll make like, oh, I want to just make a first person shooter that's like has cool game assets. Well, it's like, okay, but you need, like, what is that hook? And, you know, you want to try to have a hook. Um, so before I move on, any questions about this particular game or experience or whatever um, related to the development of this. Because I got one more game to cover. Sorry, I'm like super neurotic about these cartridges. Okay, none so far. All right, I'll, I'll move on, and then we can maybe, like, talk about it at the end. Um, and, and if you do have a question about this process, and, and when I say question about the process, I don't even mean it has to be about, like, the highfalutin, high-level design uh, questions or the academic part of it. Um, you know, you can ask me, like, I encourage... There's not an easy way for students to be taught how to release games. 
Um, and releasing games is a very different skill set than making the game. Um, and it's something that I don't think is done well. It's taught well in a lot of schools. Um, but I make it a priority to try to embody some of that. And part of that is talking about games I've released. But also another part of it is may having you do things like where you are putting it up on itch. Because um, working with responding to audiences... Um, you know, handling some of these other external parts, I can tell you as a, as a working game designer that I spend like, yes, I do my work, but I spend very little of my time consciously thinking about the tool, um, or achievement in the tool, which I know is like a focus for a lot of students because you are in the process of learning the tool, but the business of game design, the actual job of game design is off or game, being in the game development industry is the the tool is just kind of a tool um and you are really thinking about these like human parts of the experiences that you create the experiential parts but also these like release and these sort of like memory management marketing business things so please ask me about that because those are the things that like i really want to get at with some of these examples which brings up another game i made called la mancha now, these slides, I'm going to warn you, are from before I had launched it. So there's a few, like, speculative, like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm planning to do this. Well, no, now it's over and I've done it. So I can update based on... Yes, quick question about releasing games. Please ask me about releasing games. Ah, so somebody asked how to get people's attention like at, in advertising and marketing. <laughs> so <laughs> my world right now. <laughs> um, here's the thing about, about marketing yourself is that the correct answer for this is hire professionals who are marketing professionals to do the work for you. <laughs> And they are expensive and it is their job, but they deserve their money um, because they are very good at what they do. They have the ability to get in with like, you know, people that are not just, um, you know, essentially the tough thing about marketing is that you uh, have to try to break out of your, your personal network. That's always the, the goal um, and always the risk. Because uh, I liken it to this. We, I feel like that is uh, its own classes. It will be, actually. Um, it will be. So, like, later in the semester, we will talk about this in more depth. But I actually do like to talk about this, you know, when I can. Especially now, because, like, I'm literally, I have a Kickstarter launching a week from today, right? Like, this is my reality right now. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of liken it to, like, some quick tips. One, you need to get outside of your personal network. Now, it helps if your personal network is big, so networking. Two, don't be a jerk. Because if you know, if you are a if you are a mean person, people aren't gonna want to help you. It just kind of comes down to that. Um, but like, you know, be genuinely a good member of society. Um, but also a good member of the industry. So, you know, I'm, I, I've am i been criticized by people for being altruistic, but those people were jerks, so screw them. Um, so, like, you know, yeah, be cool. Like, you know, help people. And then, it, it, you know, karma, is, it's a thing. Um, so there's that aspect of it. There's, like, the interpersonal relationship building part of it. The next thing to really think about is... Um, you know, and, and with that, you can maybe like 
put something out on your channels that then might inspire people to be like, hey, this is my friend. They're making something cool. Go check it out. So then, you know, it's like they tell two friends and they tell two friends. Try to be a good member of society when releasing a game all the time, but also it, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so then it comes down to like, um, it, this is going to sound weird. When you start getting haters, that actually means that you might have succeeded in it. Um, because like with our trailer for Nemo, um, it was when we started getting YouTube comments and we're like, I don't know. And then like, we got a thumbs down and we were so excited about the thumbs down because it was like, it's not just our friends. Yes. Um, so haters can actually be a little... They're, they're like a good canary in the coal mine. Now, obviously, you don't want to get yourself into a situation that is toxic. Um, and, and I realize that I am, I will say this, I'm coming at this from a standpoint of a white cisgender guy. Um, so, you know, I am, I am by virtue of that shielded from some of the bad stuff on the internet. And uh, so I, I acknowledge that, like, you know, that level of toxicity has different levels of threateningness for people. So, you know, take take what I say with a grain of salt because I, I um, you know, I'm on easy mode when it comes to that. And, um, you know, I, I think it sucks that there is an easy mode in terms of that. So, uh, you know, uh, try to do what I can to help people out. Again, don't be a jerk. Be cool. Um, but, you know, I would say that breaking, you know, break uh if you can break outside that thing like that is a good sign that you've broken out of that that um environment just like be safe too like make sure you are safe and make sure that you do like take you can step away and take time with the people that care about you um but yeah marketing is a lot of it is like you want to make pay attention to social media stuff you want to pay attention to what um, maybe if like certain things are trending, um, you know, you don't want to put yourself in the position where you are only like, yeah, you screenshot Saturday, for example, like hashtag screenshot Saturday, but keep in mind that like that might also only reach indie developers. So it is good to try to like say, okay, well is hashtag gaming hashtag whatever, you know, trending. And then maybe try to like slip that stuff in or even try to like, um, when Dogecoin was popping off, like, a few weeks ago, I think one of the hashtags for it was to the moon, and I was like, my game's got a moon? Hashtag to the moon. Um, and, you know, that tweet actually got some traction. Um, so that can be helpful. And, like, it's just a lot of work. I mean, the other thing is just, it's just a lot of work. You gotta, like, try to, you know, if not daily, put something out as much as you can, um, and, and that, that creative novelty does help, you know, with Nemo, like the creative novelty, a lot of it is just like flat out in the art style. So it's just like, I can go and post a picture of the art and people will be like, Holy shit. you know, it looks really nice. Um, and I, and I, I realized that like, I, I'm saying all about like, Oh, don't go for rendering fidelity. But then I'm also saying my art style is nice. Um, but it, there is a difference, like rendering fidelity technical fidelity it's an art style photorealism is an art style but it also is an art style that's kind of a ticking time bomb because photoreal now is not going to be photoreal 10 years from now is not photoreal 10 years you know before now so that's always kind of like you know if you've achieved in that level you've got a very limited time to be novel good art style exists forever so art style can be like, that is, what is your creative hook? Having that gives you a little bit of a leg up to be able to advertise to those outside networks. Um, we can talk about it more too as we go on. I'm actually like glad that we broke into that topic because it is going to be an underlying topic throughout the rest of the semester is that releasing part. But in terms of releasing, so here's another game that... Um, I made to express, like, literally embody uh, the, the plot of a novel. Um, so I read Don Quixote several years ago and really liked it, and was like, "Wow, I want to make a, I want to make a game about this." But the book's like 
almost a thousand pages long. Uh, maybe that's not a great idea. Um, but then, you know, somebody uh, said, hey, let's do a tabletop game challenge within our tabletop group. Everybody come up with a game. And I was like, aha, a tabletop game. We can do this. So um, I set myself some goals. So I wanted it to be about Don Quixote. I wanted it to be, live in a small box because I like bookshelf games that can live on a bookshelf. And here is La Mancha next to my copy of the Moby Dick card game, next to Bring Your Own Book, next to books. Um, so, you know, I wanted, I had a box size in mind. So that's really useful too, because like it, with tabletop, it's, it's like the production realities. Timeline, eh. I was learning how to make a tabletop game, or not make, but publish a tabletop game for the first time. I'd made lots of little hobbyist ones, but I wanted to like put a thing in the world, right? So I gave myself like a, I let that be kind of freewheeling. It ended up being like a two, two and a half year project. Uh, assume all created, like released things are going to take up two to two and a half years of your life. Um, that's probably like a good estimate when you like set out to put a thing in the world um, for reels and not just for like a jam or something. Um, so again, I started with Don Quixote um, and I looked at it. I looked at its verbs and things that happen in Don Quixote are storytelling, uh, you know, kind of like talking and bragging about your deeds uh, as a as a heroic knight that you are not actually a heroic knight. If you've never read Don Quixote, the the uh, back of the book summary is that there is a man named Alonzo Quijano who reads too many books of chivalry. So the modern equivalent would be um, you've you've binge watched the entirety of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in like a day, right? Um, and but then you also maybe ha like haven't eaten or drank anything, and you've gone stir crazy. So he like crunches a bunch of books about knights, which are the Marvel Cinematic Universe of old, and um, then, you know, believes himself to be a knight. So he, like, dons a suit of armor and wanders out into the countryside uh, with his friend, and I wonder if that's even possible. Probably not anymore. Um, but see, that's even more time to, like, go crazy. So, you know, imagine, like, you, you binge the entire Marvel MCU, and then you grab a trash can and a set of goggles and you go start punching stuff like mailboxes in your neighborhood because you're cap because you're captain america you know that's that's don quixote so um so yeah like but then you also quote marvel comics about you know your deeds um and then you fight a bunch of stuff and you get treasures so yeah this is like that's Don Quixote. So it's like, how do we do that in a game? So there are the verbs. Let's make a game. Okay, bragging about your your deeds. Well, so there's a, a genre of this, of like games where you have these sort of canned responses, in this case, quotes of chivalry, but maybe it's just like curse words like Cards Against Humanity or pop culture references like Super Fight or, or Metagame or just words like apples to apples, where you're given some sort of question to answer and then you respond with a card. That's a pretty well established party game genre now. So I was like, well, let's do that, but with quotes from actual books of chivalry cited in Don Quixote. So there's how we answer a verb. Um, but then like, what are we responding to? Originally it started with random things, but eventually it became more fun when we got to just pretend we were in the book. So all, I, I made storytelling prompts from within the book. So the idea is you draw a storytelling prompt and then you say, uh, I'm going to deal with this by, you know, I will charge at them and as I charge, I will scream. Uh, you know, you canker worm of the virtues or something like that. Um, so then we, we kind of spun that off into like, well, what other funny things could you do? How about instead of a situation you f draw a character and then you get to declare love to them by using cards in your hand to make funny poems or something like that. Um, so again, we just kind of like spun off the, we, we juiced the mechanic and saw how far we could go. Um, and, and then, then you, you know, play, play test, play test, play test, um, get funny gifts of my buddy Jason, swinging his arms around, um, you know, add some RPG elements to like add battling. And, you know, how did this work? Well, first of all, 
Um, I actually, so again, this proved to be a good method. Um, it had cross audience appeal because of the, of the, um, subject, you know, I actually won, it, it worked for both educational purposes and libraries and classrooms, uh, but also who are studying Don Quixote, uh, Don Quixote, but it was also a fun game. I won some, uh, awards for it. Um, you know, and, and playtesting was nice because like not everybody's read the book. So it was like, how how do I model the information so everybody understands what's going on? So it is not just for people who read the book. That was also really important in marketing. Um, and, and again, like it was cool because it became a way of understanding classical work without having to read the giant, you know, doorstopper of a book, uh, which is a delightful book. But, you know, if you don't want to read, you can play La Mancha. So again, that's how we like doing stuff this way is how games become art okay and i realize we're like at time so let me let me end with this this is how games become art and this is why you know places like the smithsonian american art museum or the akron art museum are doing uh these sorts of games as art exhibitions but instead of you know at first it was good enough to be able to be like well there's pac-man we did it um, but as these things expand, as, as we become more literate in this medium, it's not good enough to just have them there. Um, with Smithsonian, you know, the, the, um, the event that I founded there, Sam Arcade, I co-founded, um, you know, it was like, at first it was good enough to have VR games because that was in like the middle of VR is new and hot. But eventually the curators were like, um, hi, can it not just be, can it just actually be like some thoughtful expression through VR? And it was like, well, what does that even mean? We had to lay out what the like aesthetics of that would look like. Um, so, you know, there is a world where games are judged on these artistic merits. And, you know, the way you make the games can lead people to, you know, really interesting investigations of this, of interactivity and meaning. Um, you know, and also making, like, uh, Art Club Challenge by Jared Huntley. It embodies a, an art style called de style um, in the way that it sets up art challenges for you to do, like make a sunset, and then kind of lets you play with these, like, cubist um, forms. Same thing with, like, Four Last Things, which is a point-and-click renaissance adventure. It's, a, it's an adventure game made out of, like, renaissance paintings cut up in Photoshop and then, like, rearranged into game characters. Um, but through that, you get to like kind of reimagine Renaissance paintings where you go and you're like, wow, what's this angel doing here? Huh? And then you realize, wait, that exists in a painting. Wow, Renaissance paintings are wild. And, and this is where you draw those connections. Um, you know, Proteus and uh, next to like, next to Impressionism. Um, or how you embody you know, higher, deeper meanings through gameplay. So here's uh, Walden, which is a game where you play as Henry David Thoreau living um, living deliberately next to Walden Pond. And, you know, it's, it's an experience that is artistically meaningful, but also is like kind of a, you know, adventure survival game um, because you are employing the activities of, you know, Thoreau in, in his book Walden. So this is why it can be really important to, when you are, you know, doing games, um, to pull from sources, to pull from ideas, to pull from other fields, you know, because our systems give us the power to do really interesting narrative, interesting artistic things. So, you know, again, this is why I always push you to go beyond just the systems, go beyond the tech, and really see what you can squeeze out of something, again, like a GB Studio that puts you in a box but what can you make with that box? Um, you know, you'll be surprised at the amazing things you can do. So, uh, that's old. So, anyway, any questions? Um, again, about the expressive parts, but also maybe about just, like, the act of making and releasing games and trying to find that, that edge.
I'm almost using it like a fidget cube now. I got it on the first shot. Um, yeah, any questions about, about, about this? There was a, there were questions about, um, you know, talking about marketing and advertising and things like that. So later in the semester, and I'm not saying that, you know, save it for that. I, I think that we should talk about this as much as possible because this is the scary, mysterious part of game making um, beyond just, again, there's a famous game designer, Rami uh, is Ismail, um, who, you know, he's a famous indie dev, and uh, he had a talk once that we visited, uh, you know, back when there were conferences, but we went to in uh, Kentucky at the Vector Conference. And he talked a lot about, um, you know, the hard questions and the easy questions of game design. And he said, like, the easy questions were the tech questions. And the students we were there with were, like, kind of aghast um, because they focus so they, they're kind of in the thick of learning the, the tech. But as Rami pointed out, Tech questions have objective answers. There is a reference guide or a, or a documentation you can look at that solves the problem. Um, the creative questions, and, and this is why I give you creative questions, is that there is no objective answer. There, are, it's like, well, how are you gonna come up with a? Re you know, you almost have to like make the question and then make the answer to the question, and then prove that you made the right answer to the right question that you also invented. Um, which is terrifying, and I agree. Um, but that's why we do it, because that's design. When you're making up a prototype for a much larger game, would you say be a good idea to split up mechanics into different prototypes? Absolutely. Because um, here's, here's why. You, wanna, you want to address prototypes in... You want to address mechanics like in as much isolation as you can, or at least one at a time. Because... If you try to do, like, build the whole thing at once and then be like, there's my prototype, um, and it's bad, you don't know which thing is the bad thing. So you kind of, like, make a core, and at that point it'll probably be very, like, make a core game loop. At that point it's probably barely playable, but you maybe then at least, like, you know, okay, now I know how to make this better or make it worse or, you know, or, like, cut it, or whatever, um, you know, so you're testing in isolation, it's like scientific method, you know, you come up with a hypothesis, you test, you know, it's easier to test one thing at a time. In terms of different prototypes, why that's helpful is that by doing them, sometimes, like, part of the, the purpose of this class in particular is that I'm teaching you a bunch of tools that are good prototyping tools, and, but they're, tools that are maybe good at one thing or another and it's not like on one hand it's like they're good at one type of game or another but they might just be good at capturing one type of experience or another meaning that you know it's probably harder to make uh it, it's harder to make a choose your own adventure in game maker than it is in twine so if you're doing like really choose your own adventure like you're trying to wireframe a, a user interface or something. You're trying to like test a basic use the idea of a user interface or something like that. You know, making a user interface in Game Maker is going to take you longer than it will in Twine. So it's part about like, what am I making? Okay, let me pick this tool because it it will do this real fast. So sometimes you might have a Twine prototype for one system and a GB Studio prototype for another system, and then maybe your main branch is you know Unity or Game Maker or something. And then you kind of like, we did this with Nemo over the summer. One of the summer interns uh, was like, you know, we set him to do some interface stuff. And he's like, hey, I made this twine. And we we're like, yes. Um, and we understood what the menu system would be, you know, right away. Without having to like click through a bunch of stuff in Unity and, you know, wait for him to make it in Unity. So um, it can, yeah, you're probably going to have a few things going at one time, and, and that's pretty normal. And then you kind of like, you know, if you've got the logic of that system, then you can go and build it in in Unity or whatever your final destination is. It's that, it's that you know, hours of planning can save you months of screwing up making it kind of thing. 
Yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to cut us off, but I will be in the Discord for chatting. Um, but thank you for the excellent discussion. Um, that is really the thing that like I think makes this class so rich and meaningful. Do you need to get any licenses for releasing games? No. Like in terms of like legal licenses? No. Um, I would establish a company. Um, and that can take many forms. My company is a single... Uh, is a sole proprietor LLC, which means that the money made through the company can just get rolled into my personal taxes. Um, you know, usually you maybe carry some insurance, depends on like the scope of your releasing. Um, but yes, thank you for asking that, because that is, that is all the stuff that like, you know, it's hard to teach in, in a game design class is like you know oh yeah you gotta gotta do business at some point um but yeah in terms of like yeah you it's not like my former life doing architecture where like i would have had to um i would have had to like go take an exam and get a stamp to prove that i will not make buildings that fall down like if our games crash it's not really going to hurt anybody so also great question thank you for asking that um, all right. Anyway, I'll be in Discord if anybody needs any filing taxes. Yeah. Again, that's why sole proprietor is pretty great because it's just, it's like maybe an extra page or two. If you <laughs> think about not making it or not, if you don't have a ton of expenses, then you don't actually have to, you get the easier business form. Um, you know, the year I had to actually produce my, my, uh, La Mancha game. Uh, I had to do the harder tax form because I had all the uh, the shipping and production and all that other expense. So, yeah. Yep. With that, I, I will talk to you later.